NFL show brought to you by betnow.eu. Make sure you go to betnow.eu. Use the promo code TRUTH100 to get 100% cash back bonus on your first deposit up to $500. That promo goes for six more days till the end of the month. I am your co-host for the NFL show, Mike Goodpaster. Right now, I'd like to welcome from the FF Faceoff, Anthony Savino. How you doing, Anthony? I'm doing awesome. How are you? All right, and we have a special guest today. He writes those messed up quarterback power rankings on the gruelingtruth.com every Wednesday. Help me welcome to the show, and I was just kidding about the messed up part. For the most part, Sam Teets. How you doing, Sam? I'm doing good. Good afternoon. All right, Sam goes to the University of North Carolina, so we'll have to excuse anything he says on the air. I just wanted to get the disclaimer out there. Anthony, Melvin Gordon, is he coming back? Yeah, I'm seeing that there's a shot that Melvin Gordon can report as soon as tomorrow. Now, there's no official date, uh, but even if he does report tomorrow, he will not play on Sunday. I believe the soonest he'll be able to play is the first game in October, which is uh, week five. Yeah, and I would think, Sam, the way the Chargers are going right now, even though Austin Eckler has played really well, they need Melvin Gordon. I mean, they absolutely need all the help they can get at this point after dropping two straight. I mean, this is a team last year we thought would actually beat the Chiefs and have a chance of making the Super Bowl. They certainly don't look like that right now. But this is the typical Chargers, though, right? They usually start slow, and then all of a sudden they find their groove and, and go on a run. And Melvin Gordon's only going to help. Yeah, but I also think this. In the I mean, past, they started one and two last year. They started zero and four in 2017. Did they make the playoffs in 2017? No. No. So they need him back, and they need him quick. Luckily, they played the Miami Dolphins this week, so that should lead to being two and two. Um, Sam, Jalen Ramsey, you think he's sick? You think his back's hurt? <laughs> uh, I think Jalen Ramsey's just fine. I think he just he wants out. He absolutely does not want to play another game for the Jacksonville Jaguars. He's done with that franchise to that organization. And now he's just trying to stay as far away from them as possible. Anthony, what's your take here? You agree? I think there's nothing else you can take from this but this. Yeah, I, I agree there. And I was trying to, you know, keep find reasons to keep Jalen Ramsey. Maybe they can bury the hatchet and then this defense can continue to play well and somehow they navigate to the postseason. But when you have a player like Jalen Ramsey, as disruptive as he is on the field, he's also being pretty disruptive off the field. He's going to eventually tear that locker room apart. Um, and they got to get rid of him and get two first round picks and look ahead to uh, you know the draft in 2020. All right, let's go to Jay Gruden, who probably never should have been hired in Washington, but Daniel Snyder is the owner. Anthony, is this a must-win game for him to keep his job, or is Daniel Snyder going to keep him all year no matter what? Um, It's Daniel Snyder. It's the Redskins. Um, All he has to do is win a few games and then be competitive in the rest, and all of a sudden Jay Gruden's going to get a contract extension. So, I don't think he's on the hot seat right now, possibly in the offseason, but I don't see uh, Daniel Snyder making an in-season move. Well, should he be on the hot seat right now, Sam? Because it's not like the three opponents were easy. You had the Eagles, the Cowboys, the Bears, but Jay Gruden's never proven he can coach football anyways. Yeah, no, this organization's pretty much just a mess. In an ordinary situation, he would be on a hot seat, considering the lack of success over the years. Uh, but the Redskins, you never know what they're going to do. Dan Schneider is a pretty interesting owner. I have no reason to believe that he's actually going to be fired during the season. I think Gruden will be around for the rest of the year. I think the Redskins will have a up-and-down season, and we'll change Wayne Haskins for the next couple of weeks. Yeah, and the problem here, Anthony, is if you do fire Jay Gruden, who the hell wants to work for Daniel Snyder? You'd have to get a young guy, wouldn't you? Similar to Jay Gruden. You think? Uh, it would have to be somebody young. I, I mean, you know, well, either that or somebody old that has no other chance to be a head coach. Right. Because, that's. I mean, yeah. Jeff Fisher comes to mind if Jeff he wants Fisher. to get back in the league. That would be so awesome. 
And then the Miami Dolphins would have somebody they could possibly beat. Yeah. Jeff Fisher. Damn. I, I wasn't expected to do an NFL show this year and ever bring up Jeff Fisher at all. I, I mean, that, that's that's what you're looking at. As long as the Washington Redskins have Bruce Allen as your general manager and Daniel Snyder as the owner, you're going to be left with the Jeff Fishers of the world because as bad as these young coordinators, as bad as they want to be a head coach in the NFL, they also know that they can wait another year and a better opportunity will open up than Washington. Well, you know, that's how I know that the Bengals screwed up by getting Sam McVay because anybody that was willing to come to Cincinnati was doomed for failure, and I think the same thing will go for Washington. All right, Sam, tell everybody your criteria for your weekly quarterback power rankings. All right, so this is basically a, a spectrum I have for quarterbacks move up and down based on how they do every single week. So for quarterbacks, like, for instance, the quarterbacks have just gotten their first start this week. They're going to be kind of in the middle of the list because we've only seen them for one game versus quarterbacks who have played the entire season. We'll see them up towards the top of the list. And mainly looking at it, look at how statistically they do. You also have to consider some of the players around them, so they have a bad supporting cast. You get a little bit of an advantage there because I have to keep, like, looking at the skill of the quarterback, not necessarily the skill of the team around him. So I'm trying to do my best to isolate the quarterback and see how well they're playing in a vacuum. But – I think we got a pretty good we got a pretty good consensus here towards the top of the list though if you look at it. We got Patrick Mahomes starting off at number one. Any problems there? Um I still think Tom Brady's the best, but Oh, you going for Tom Brady? I, would I, I can see that. Brady. I don't like I don't have a problem with people considering Tom Brady the best quarterback in the NFL. It's freaking but Mahomes Tom Brady. is putting it Tom Brady is just like the curse that just keeps on coming for you. There's no way to stop him. No, like, it isn't. He's not a curse. Point. I love Tom Brady. You love Tom Brady? Hell I'm yeah. The only reason you don't is because you're a Pittsburgh Steelers fan, Sam. And they kick your maybe, ass all the maybe time. Maybe I'm a little biased against Tom Brady in that case, yeah. Yeah, and Tom Brady is like my favorite player in NFL history. Because Oh, really? Yeah, because without Tom Brady, I'll say it again, the Pittsburgh Steelers would have like four or five more rings. So Tom Brady. Yeah, I know that. You. That's why you don't like him. And that's why on your list you put him at number two. It just You just can't bring yourself to put him at number one. But I can tell you this. <laughs> if you had to play like a championship game and you had to have a quarterback, I still think number one on this list should be Tom Brady because I still think Tom Brady's who everybody would take. I agree with you in that case. In that, in that specific situation, I would absolutely take Tom Brady. But isn't that all that matters? Because that does, doesn't that make him the best quarterback right now? If, if I give you a choice of all quarterbacks in the NFL and you're going to pick Tom Brady first, how would you then rank Patrick Mahomes number one? Because if it's a regular season game, I'm taking Mahomes. Because right now, Mahomes can just go out there and throw for like 350 and three touchdowns a week. But when it comes down to that clutch situation of a must-win game, like a championship game or a playoff scenario, I'm absolutely taking Tom Brady. Because Brady will just pull the magic off at the very end of the game. I know he'll do it every single time. But for a regular season game, I'm still taking Mahomes because he's just the guy who puts up all the numbers. And I feel like he's just going to crush every team he goes against until he faces the Patriots. Okay, so we agree that Tom Brady is the best, but you're ranking Patrick Mahomes number one. Anthony, what do you think? <laughs> I mean, I, you know, as much as I like Tom Brady, um, the, Pat Mahomes has been on a tear really since week one of last season in the regular season. Now he's doing it without Tyreek Hill, uh, without his top running back, and he just, you know, beat the Baltimore Ravens. Uh, who are, you know, the, the best defense that he's probably faced this season so far. So, yeah, I think Pat Mahomes deserves to be up top. Um, if this is a postseason power rankings, uh, then you put Brady up there, of course. But right now it's Pat Mahomes. Okay, so we all agree Tom Brady's the best. All right, next up we've got Russell Wilson at number three. Anybody disagree with that? You good with number three, Anthony? Uh, I... Where's Dak, right? Where, you know, Dak, Dak wait a second. Needs... I don't want to hear this because Dak Prescott <laughs> doesn't even make a pimple on Russell Wilson's ass, and I love Dak Prescott. But you know what? If you put Dak Prescott on that team in Seattle, they'd be 4-12. and 12. Russell Wilson is I mean, the Russell only thing Wilson, keeping that they, team they, afloat. Coming off of a loss, 
he put up big numbers, threw the ball 50 times. I, I get he had a big game, you know, 400 and what? Uh, 406 50, yards, two touchdowns. 450 yards. total yards, if you want to include what he did rushing. But the team lost. Yeah. And yeah, that's not nothing to do with him. I mean, the the Cowboys won, and it had nothing to do with Dak Prescott this week. Yeah, look what, at Dak, Dak accounted for what? Three touchdowns? Uh, no, Dak played against the Miami Dolphins. That's why Dak won this week. <laughs> it had nothing to do with anything else other than they were playing Miami. <laughs> and that's the same way when, when Tom Brady beat Miami. It's because they were playing Miami. It wasn't because of Tom Brady. Miami's horrible. But Russell Wilson is already, to me, a Hall of Fame quarterback. So I don't know how you would put Dak Prescott anywhere near him. Um, my problem is this. Yeah, but this He's, is a power oh, Wait a second. A, I'm going to, yes. Rankings. At a power rankings, Russell Wilson had a better game in a worse situation. You're, you're saying the Hall of Fame, or then you're talking about a career. Yeah. Then what? You want to put. Uh... Okay. How about this? Dak Prescott against a very, 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 very bad Miami Dolphins team was 19 for 32 for 246 yards, two touchdowns, one interception against a bad and a Miami rushing team. touchdown and a rushing touchdown okay Russell Wilson had two rushing touchdowns he ran for 51 yards he threw two touchdown passes he was 32 for 50 for 406 yards against a decent Saints defense uh, and that game there's no turnovers here Russell Wilson's I mean, the one that got him back in the game Chris Carson and the special teams put him in a position where they couldn't win that game. I, I mean, aside from you have Russell Wilson, three, Aaron Rodgers, four, Deshaun Watson, five, Matt Ryan, six, Carson, one, seven, then Dak, three of those quarterbacks lost. They're, they, they're on losing teams. Matt Ryan, one and two. Carson Wentz, one and two. Okay. So you're saying a quarterback can't be good if he's on a losing team. I think wins, unless we're talking about fantasy football. How about this? I wins think if, have to if matter. Russell Wilson wins matter. Gets Seattle to the playoffs with a nine and seven record. It's more impressive than Dak Prescott getting the Cowboys there at twelve and four. Because Russell Wilson has no offensive line, he doesn't have much in the way of weapons, and his defense is not very good. And so let's Pete pen, so, it, so it's a Troy Aikman narrative. Uh, all over again. No, it's not a Troy Aikman thing because Russell Wilson is better than Troy Aikman, too. Oh, okay. <laughs> okay, he's not. But you know what? Common sense would tell me he is because okay. Russell Wilson is one of the best quarterbacks uh. I've ever seen. Russell Wilson is playing with a head coach of Pete Carroll, who's an idiot. He's playing That's with a no Pete Carroll's. I, I, I think Pete Carroll's a great head coach. Yeah, he's fucking horrible. All, all we got to do is we got to have a few guys on that have played <laughs> for Pete Carroll before. And then they can explain to you what Pete Carroll is. Pete Carroll, you know, walked in. They got a great defense. They won a couple championships. They've done nothing since except get Russell Wilson beat the hell up. He slips him into the playoffs every once in a while. Pete Carroll's pathetic. We need to have Joe. I call Joe Kelly right now. He can tell you all about Pete Carroll. Joe played for him for a few years in New York. So I don't have much use for Pete Carroll, as you can see. Because if Pete Carroll was a great coach the way you think he is, don't you think at some point he would have tried to get an offensive line and tried to keep the defense from completely falling off the face of the earth? I mean, they drafted uh, offensive linemen a few years ago in the first round, and they missed. Jermaine Ifridi. Yeah. So, and they missed. And the thing is this, anybody that watched Ifridi knew that they missed, and they still drafted him. And Pete Carroll is the guy in charge of who they draft there. So if he misses on draft picks, that's on him. It's not on the front office. It's on Pete Carroll. And this team has consistently gotten worse over the last five years, correct? I guess if you can call it worse. I mean, I, 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 I could call it worse. Was the last time they won a playoff game? Well, they did run into the Cowboys last year. So. Oh, yeah, because the Cowboys <laughs> were such a juggernaut that the Cowboys got their ass beat down the next week. All right, so I, I I believe this. I think Dak Prescott should be ahead of Aaron Rodgers right now if we're just going off what they've done lately, though. Yeah, Aaron Rodgers. You know, that team, he's, gonna, he's starting to look more and more vulnerable on this list as we're going forward. For now, I'm keeping up there because Green Packers are finding ways to kind of 
pull off these games and Rodgers isn't having to do a ton to win these games because the, their defense is actually doing a lot better. But guys like Jair, Jair Alexander, they got some pass rushers finally again. But I still have Rodgers at four because he's on that team that's managed to pull off some wins. And we all know he can be. It's just a question of what his supporting cast gives him week to week. So he's at four for now, but I'm not, I'm not above moving him down the list. Here you know, I, I think Aaron Rodgers is still trying to figure out that offense. And we're going to know a lot uh, tomorrow night, Thursday night football. Yeah, they should uh, tear the Eagles, Eagles secondary up. Uh, I mean, they're, they're a bottom five uh, secondary right now in points and production allowed to quarterbacks and wide receivers. So Aaron Rodgers should really catch a groove tomorrow night. And if it doesn't happen, then I think there's something wrong. And let's hope there is, because I can't stand the Green Bay Packers and their fans. Um, <laughs> number five, Deshaun Watson. Any problems with that, Anthony? No. You know, the Texans are winning. and Deshaun Watson is is playing well enough. Now, he's not putting up uh, your prototypical Deshaun Watson numbers, but he's also getting beat up um, just about as much as he did last year with no real improvement despite bringing uh, Laramie Tunsil. Well, he put up huge numbers this week. So, 351 yards, three I'm touchdowns. I'm talking about two weeks ago. Yeah, I, he had a rough week, too. Uh, but he did win the game. Uh, number six, Matt Ryan. Three touchdowns, one interception, 29 for 34, 304 yards. Um, to me, the only, the only problem they don't have in Atlanta is who's playing quarterback, Sam. Yeah, besides Matt Ryan and Julio Jones, everything seems to be just falling apart for Atlanta. You would think – looking at that team, that they would be able to win games with that kind of offensive players that they have. And Matt Ryan, like, he only had five incompletions. He went 29 for 34. But that offense just, for some reason, isn't doing enough, and the defense is just not helping them at all at this point. So right. Atlanta is really looking that they could struggle further down the line. Yeah, I want to get to this right now because Carson Wentz at number seven ahead of Dak Prescott at eight. I hate to sound like Anthony, but what in the hell are you smoking, Sam? <sighs> yeah. Well, Wentz, it's, it's always a question of always a question of what if with Carson Wentz. No, it's always a and question is just, when's the last time he played well. Yeah. Well, I don't know. I get sometimes I get captivated by his potential and I see him play. This past week there was a little bit of a rough situation with the wide receivers. They were missing Alshon Jeffrey and Deshaun Watson. And I think they had something like seven or eight drops during the game or something like that. And one of them was a potential touchdown. But so his, his supporting cast the receiver was terrible this past week. Uh, but yeah, I can see why you put Dak Prescott ahead of Carson Wentz. The only reason for me holding Dak back is he has played against some really, really bad teams. I mean, Dak played what the Giants, the Redskins, and the Dolphins. Like those are really put, kind of pushover teams that you should beat down very much. So, but that's the only reason for holding Dak back now. He plays against the Saints this coming week. So if Dak has a good game against the Saints. I mean, he'll vault all the way up Why? towards the top five. For Why? Sure. For beating the Saints, who are not a good football team. They've got Teddy Bridgewater. They beat Seattle because of special teams and Chris Carson fumbles. It's nothing Teddy Bridgewater did. I think this, and I'm going to get to it before Anthony, I think the Dallas Cowboys are going to beat the New Orleans Saints in New Orleans by more than – they're going to beat them by double digits. I don't – Mike, see, I'm worried about that. No. I don't see the Saints, it. I think the this Saints is going to secondary be... is absolutely atrocious, and Teddy Bridgewater – it's shitty. Yeah, Bridgewater's just a placement holder, honestly. He goes in there, and he lets Michael Thomas make him look really good, pretty much. Him and Alvin Kamara kind of holding things up right now. And he happens to Drew Brees. All Bridgewater is is a game manager at this point. I don't think he's good enough to be a game manager. I think you're safe in this one as much as you can be in a league where anything can happen at any given time except for the Miami Dolphins winning. Um... So I, I assume you like Dak better than Carson, Anthony? Yeah, right now, Dak Prescott is playing better than Carson Wentz, and Dak Prescott played better than Carson Wentz after he got Amari Cooper last season. You know, I think we're all enamored with Carson Wentz in 2017 when he was on his M little MVP run, but if you look back to Carson Wentz's rookie year, uh, he was very pedestrian. Dak outplayed him. And Carson Wentz, after the injury, has been, you know, he's shown upside, but he's been, you know, not that guy that 
people expect him to be. So I think the question is, who the hell is Carson Wentz? Yeah, and remember this. You talked about who Dak beat. You know, Dak didn't have to come from behind to beat the Washington Redskins. Um, I don't remember who the Eagles beat in the middle, but they also lost at home to Detroit. I think Detroit's a better team. No, the, the Eagles think. didn't beat any. I mean, they, they beat the Redskins, and they lost to the Falcons, and yeah, then the they Falcons. lost last week. So the Falcons, we just talked about, are a mess, and he lost to them. He lost to the Lions, who might be all right, and they had to come from behind against the Redskins. So I think they're still nuts here. I think that Dak should be ahead of him. <laughs> Number nine, Phillip Rivers. I, I I don't know. What do you think, Anthony? Is that too high, or are you all right with number nine? Uh, you know, Rivers last week, you know, had a, lost a fumble, threw a couple touchdowns. It was a competitive game. I think it's a little bit too high. I would still bump Lamar Jackson up ahead of Phillip Ooh, Rivers right now. I think Lamar Jackson needs to drop down to about 15 to 20. I don't think Lamar Jackson has proven he can play quarterback in the NFL. I think he played against two really bad defenses, and the Chiefs' defense is not that great. And what did he complete? Fifty percent of his passes. I mean, I mean, he thirty-one of forty-six. Huh? Thirty-one of forty-six. He was twenty-two for forty-three, wasn't he? Oh yeah, you're right. You're right. I was looking at Rivers' uh, stat line. Yeah, and if you look at him last year when he played the better teams that had a little bit of defense, he had trouble. I think there's issues here, Sam, with Lamar Jackson's accuracy, especially throwing the ball, you know, in that 10 to 20 yard range. I think 10 is a huge overreach, and I think this, I, I think Joe Jacoby Brissett is better than Lamar Jackson, and I think Jacoby Brissett, the way he has played, I would have him up around number six, maybe number five. Really, well, Jacoby Brissett certainly has proven himself. That was the guy we were all questioning going into the year when Andrew Luck retired all of a sudden. He's come in and he's played really well. Uh, he's got great completion percentages so far. He's kept the ball. He's not turned it over. And he's actually excelled. Some people were talking about him potentially just being a kind of game manager quarterback at the start of the year. But he's actually come in and been a real contributor to that offense and been a real powerhouse for them. And they're going to need him going forward considering T.Y. Hilton might not be fully healthy. With, uh, with Lamar Jackson, he's up at 10 because through the first two weeks, he was so good. But this past week, like you said, no, no passing touchdowns, completed about 50% of his passes. He worries me on a week-to-week -week basis. And also, two of those passes they completed where he just threw the ball up. And his guy, he got lucky. His guy bailed him out and made a jump catch over a defensive player. That really shouldn't have happened on two different situations. So, his numbers this week are probably even a little bit inflated by great plays made by the receivers. But uh, I, am I am concerned about him moving forward, though. Well, I, I think this. I think the Ravens are overrated, but they'll still win the AFC North because it's horrible. Anthony, what do you think? Jacoby Brissett, Lamar Jackson? I'm not ready to anoint uh, Jacoby Brissett and put him in the Nobody Lamar Jackson him. conversation. He is a lot better than Lamar. Lamar Jackson's never done anything to be in a conversation for a top ten. Jacoby Brissett played well when Andrew Luck was out a couple years ago. I mean, Lamar Jackson played well enough to get to the Ravens to the postseason last year, and uh, he has them at 2-1 and one right now and ran into the Kansas City Chiefs. Let's see, you know, I, I want to see how he bounces back this week against the Browns. If Lamar Jackson bounces back and looks oh like God, Lamar, the Browns like, are the, terrible. Okay, I mean, the so then he should put sucks. up big numbers. He should put up big numbers and win. No, he will put up big numbers because it's the Browns, okay. just like he put up big numbers against Miami. But that's but you what know you're what? supposed to do. That's what you're supposed yeah, to do. Yeah, but no, what you're and supposed to do is when you play a good team, you're supposed to put up big numbers if you're a top 10 quarterback. I mean, right? what am I? I mean, who has he played against that was real good that he put up big numbers against? We can go back to last year, too. I mean, if you go back to last year, when but he, he, they he made won the last year, he won. He won. Okay, yeah, he won great. Tim I mean, Tebow won in too. The, in the yeah, no, here are you gonna bring Tebow up Tim Tebow? Playoff game. Lamar Jackson <laughs> last week or last year in the playoffs against the Chargers at home was fourteen for twenty nine for a hundred and ninety yards. I don't think that that's that great. I mean, he beats the Browns before that. He beats the Buccaneers. He beats the Falcons. He loses to the Chiefs. 
He beats the Raiders. He beats the Bengals. So in his 5-1 and one run to get into the playoffs, he was 5-0 and oh against bad teams, and he was 0-1 oh against good teams. So I, I think it's a little soon. I think Lamar I mean, Jackson Tom, could. I mean, Tom Brady, for the past 20 years, had to play the AFC East. You know, Tom Brady also has won how many Super Bowls where I'm, there was I'm just, no okay, AFC East teams but, but to play? But still, sometimes you got to take the breaks that come to you. No, because the thing is, if Tom Brady on average wins five games every year in the AFC East, which makes him five and one, for his career, he's averaged 11 or eleven to 12 wins during the season, which means he's what? Eight and three against everybody else? That's not that bad. And, you know, if you want to go there, look at Pat Mahomes last season, right? Um he lost against some of the good teams. He, he lost to New England, the Rams, Seattle, the Chargers, lost again in New England. And who did he beat? Beat Denver twice, Cincinnati, Cleveland, exactly. Arizona. I'm not the one that anoints Patrick Mahomes. I'm the one that sit here and says, give it a couple years and we'll see. I mean, I, that's why I would not put Patrick Mahomes at number one on this list. Because he's not going to beat Tom Brady. He's just not. And a lot of that may not be his fault because his coach is Andy Reid, but still. I mean, I, I think we anoint people way too soon. Patrick Mahomes has played, what, 18 or 19, 20 regular season games in his career, and we're going to rank him number one on our power rankings? I don't care if he threw 10 touchdown passes, no interceptions through every one of those games. He's still in his second year. I remember watching Mark Rippon be the NFL MVP, win the Super Bowl MVP, and then disappearing from the face of the earth two years, three years but later. Th- but this isn't all-time power rankings. This is right now. Yeah, and right now, what you just told me was, you doubt Patrick Mahomes, too, because he hasn't beaten anybody. There is doubt there. And if there's doubt there, how could he be number one as a power ranking? Because there, there's nothing he's done that's made him any better than Tom Brady so far. I mean, last week... Brady was 28 for 42. Mahomes was 27 for 37. They both threw for over 300 yards, one with three touchdowns, one with two touchdowns. So the differing factor to me in a power ranking is they're both playing as well as anybody right now. But Tom Brady's done that for almost 20 years. Patrick Mahomes has done it for like 18 games. So that's where my power ranking would be. And I'm not convinced on Mahomes. I think he I'm I'm pretty convinced he's gonna be a hell of a quarterback. But I think that, you know, maybe he's a little bit of a product of this offense because you don't see a lot of fifteen to twenty five yard completions down the field. He's usually gunning a damn thing down the field or getting rid of it quick. So I think Jacoby Brissett gets the short end of the stick here. And I think Jacoby Brissett could take the Colts to the playoffs. I believe I, I believe Jacoby Brissett can too. I, I I never doubted him. I didn't think he was going to be this productive offensively as he's been. Yeah, and we look. But at I their... I love you know the, and one of the biggest reasons why I believed in Brissett and the Colts coming into the season uh, is because when he had a start a couple of years ago, he only turned the ball over what uh, right around ten times, maybe one more, one less. But he didn't turn the ball over a lot, so I knew he can at least manage a game. Well, I and think the Colts the, have talent. I, I think the Colts are much better than they were two years ago. I think they can win ten games right. with him and get into the playoffs. Just the difference between him and Andrew Luck is, if you got Andrew Luck, you can win the Super Bowl. If you're Jacoby Brissett, you might be able to win a playoff game. But I can also say this, on this list of 36 quarterbacks, there's probably only about a third of them that are capable of winning a playoff game. Um, Number 12, Derek Carr, 27 for 34, 242 yards, two touchdowns, one interception. Anthony, you are Derek Carr at number 12? I don't know. I, I think that's a little bit high for Derek Carr. I'm also not a big Derek Carr guy. Um, I would see it, it, it's tough with these next few because, you know, the Rams are undefeated right now. And Jared Goff, um, he's doing his best without Todd Gurley. And I think that's what really uh, that's the issue with Jared Goff. He plays his best when he has. Uh, an elite running back in a running game, and he doesn't have that right now, but he's still, you know, managing the games 
uh, well enough to win. Now, he did turn the ball over three times, so maybe you do keep Derek Carr at 12 if Jared Goff didn't commit three turnovers, but that's really tough. How about this? I think yeah, my- the Rams would be damn near unstoppable if Derek Carr was their quarterback. Oh, I don't care. I mean, <laughs> yeah, my issue with this with this section right here is that there's so many, like, it's Derek Carr, Jared Goff, and Jameis Winston, like, give or take – which one, depending on the day of the week, one could be good and one could be bad. Like, they're so up and down. And Goff, as, Goff like, so the first 11 weeks of last season, Goff completed 70% or more of his passes seven times. Since the bye week last week, he has not done that once. So it's just, Goff is so up and down. He does not look like the same quarterback he was at the start of last season. So, I mean, I'm kind of, I'm losing, I'm losing Goff. Like, well, I'm I'll tell you, I, I would now. put Goff below Carr and Winston just for the simple fact that Carr and Winston have a little bit of reason to be spotty because their teams are spotty. Jared Goff, I mean, with the talent around him, should probably not have too many off games at all. Yeah, he's got three great wide receivers in Brandon Cooks, Robert Woods, Cooper Cup. He really should probably be doing better than he is. I don't understand some of the decisions he makes, how he ends up with two interceptions and a, like, and a fumble. When he's got a decent offensive line, he's got guys who can help him out, so I don't know why he ends up making some of the decisions he does. But I'm worried about him moving forward, honestly, because he could really end up being the guy who holds his team back if he keeps turning the ball over. Yeah. Um, next up, you got 15, Gardner Minshew, 16, Kyle Allen, 17, Daniel Jones, 18, Andy Dalton. What do you think, Anthony? I like the way Daniel Jones played last year. Um, last week. Did you skip over Kyle Allen? No, I just oh, said no, you Kyle didn't. Allen. Yes. Yeah. Uh, see, this is pretty tough. See, I want to put Daniel Jones a little bit higher because the Tampa Bay defense was coming in hot. You lose Saquon Barkley early. You have no running game. And Daniel Jones uh, has a debut of debuts. Uh, so I might actually put Daniel Jones at 15. Um, I would put even Kyle Allen ahead of Gardner Minshew, and I like Gardner Minshew, but I think there's something here with Kyle Allen. Week 17 last year, I'll keep going back to it. People forget it was a meaningless game against the Saints, but Kyle Allen won it, didn't commit a turnover, threw two touchdowns, about 250 yards, uh, and he comes back uh, in his first game this season and plays well. And now he has an exploitable matchup coming up with the Houston Texans. I think Kyle Allen, um, if he keeps playing well, who knows if they shut Cam Newton down. And then there's Gardner Minshew I would put right in the back at number 17. Well, I would Because say... I'm going to put uh, that win on Thursday night more to the defense than Gardner Minshew because Gardner Minshew opened the game up with two quick touchdowns and then didn't do anything for three quarters. Yeah, but you know what? Those two quick touchdowns puts pressure on the other team's offense, which makes it easier for your defense to play too, though. So without those two quick plays, you don't get anything. I I think this, I think it's too early to tell with all of them. And and the thing that stands out is Kyle Allen, Daniel Jones had their first starts on the road. That's much easier than your first start at home. Let's see how they do in the next game. And the week 16 last year, as you said, was a throwaway game anyways. Um, I think to have Andy Dalton behind any of those guys is nuts. But I think it's nuts to have Dalton behind Jameis Winston. I think it's nuts to have him behind Jared Goff. I'd put him somewhere around 12. Yeah, that's where I had him last week. But he came out this past week and he had two interceptions and a lot. It just so looked more... the fact that, you know, the interception at the end of the game is tipped, doesn't matter? And it's tipped uh, because probably... the offensive line is pathetic? <laughs> yeah. I probably should consider that more, but looking at it, like, it's just hard right now, especially those three guys you said, Minshew, Allen, and Daniel Jones. We're still kind of feeling them out, so those three are kind of really shiftable. I and they won. They won about. their games. Yeah, and they did win. The thing is this. They beat also... the Cardinals the Titans, and the Bucks. So, then Andy Dalton lost in the last seconds to a 3-0 and team with a really good defense where he did bring them from 14 nothing down early in the fourth quarter, late in the third quarter. It's true, but I thought he could have played better early on to start the game. I thought they could have won. They honestly probably should have won that game if they had had all their pieces if in they place. Had a, if they would have a head coach, yeah, they could win. But the play calling there is so <laughs> damn bad. There's not much that can be done with Opie Taylor running the show. 
But that's a whole yeah, other I think show Dal- that I'll have the night at 7 o'clock with Joe Kelly. <laughs> It'll be an interesting. <laughs> and how do you have Mitchell too, Trubisky at number 19? Uh, it's, I wasn't impressed. You know, honestly, Mitchell Trubisky's up there more so because I wasn't impressed with everyone else below him. And he yeah, has three touchdowns. Josh Allen and two. Matt Stafford have to be ahead of him. Maybe Josh Allen, but I'm not impressed with Matt Stafford, what he's been doing. Like, they got, he's gotten wins. Staff was playing looked... better this year than he has in two seasons. Yeah, he's not turning the ball. He's playing better than he did last year. He's playing better than he did last year. Last year was horrible, but this year he's playing a little better. I'm still like, I'm not a Stafford guy. He worries me a lot. Well, you know what? Josh Allen worries me a hell of a lot more than Matthew Stafford. Well, that's a good point. Josh yeah. Allen's very, still very raw. He's got, like, he has that potential, obviously, but he's still a raw player who makes a lot of bad decisions at points in time. I'll hold the ball too often and make a bad throw, and you just wonder why he even bothered doing that sometimes. Buffalo's got a good defense, but their issue right now is Josh Allen needs to be able to control the ball more often. They can't have these silly turnovers. Yeah, and they're going to because that's what he does. He's one of those gunslingers, which you never win with in the end. Uh, Mitchell Trubisky, I have no hope for. I have some hope for Josh Allen, and I know Matt Stafford can play. That's why I'd switch that. I think Teddy Bridgewater at 22. I don't know about that. I, I'd take Kyler Murray ahead of him. Yeah, it's, it's more based on the past week's performance. If you want to talk about who I would rather have, I'd rather honestly have Kyler Murray or Baker Mayfield, even though Mayfield's been terrible to start the year. But it's hard. Bridgeport, I mean, Murray's got those two interceptions on him. Uh, that team hasn't won anything. I don't know if they're going to win anything this no, year. No, they're not because they're, they're playing, terrible. Well, they play the Dolphins, yeah, I think, don't they? Oh, they have a chance then. No, they'll There's win hope. then. Yeah, they should win that game. If they don't win that game, they should fire everyone. But oh, they probably should. Fire I don't know. They were going anyway. against. <laughs> yeah, they were going against the winless Panthers though this past week. Someone's going to come out there with a win. I thought it could be the Cardinals. Kyler Murray, the two interceptions really killed them there. In they just got rolled over the entire game. So Murray down at twenty three this week. Could bounce back though. Just needs to be able to avoid those rookie mistakes like those interceptions. All right. I think he got bigger Mayfield too high. Yeah, that's that's an interesting one. I'm still like maybe I'm still captivated by what he did as a rookie, but this, this year it's been so bad. Hey, like, I don't remember this. How he go back and look at who he beat to captivate you as a rookie. I mean they were almost I think every win was against a below five hundred team. Yeah. Maybe I just got caught by the mystique that the Browns might actually have a quarterback for once. But it's been I, – I can complete more than 50% of the passes I throw if I just lobbed it up towards Odell Beckham every time. And he hasn't even been able to do that. Like, I don't understand how this offense has gone so far down the drain. The offensive line's not great, but even so, with Landry and Chubb and Odell, you should be able to do something more than what Baker Mayfield's done. It's play calling. It's play calling. Freddie Kitch's play calling is terrible. you got to play call for the bad offensive line. And letting Kevin Zeitler go, I still think, was a monstrous screw-up by them. But I think their ownership's as enamored with big-name skill position players as their fans are. And their fans are all idiots, so that'll tell you what the ownership is, too. Um, 25, Kirk Cousins. I actually thought he played all right this week. Um, But do you think, Anthony... That maybe Kirk Cousins isn't playing as well because of the way they're calling the game and they're more of a run dominant team and maybe he can't get in a in a rhythm. Yeah, I think that's it right there because Kirk Cousins last season he played really good football and that was without Dalvin Cook and Latavius Murray. He was you know an efficient back, but he is no Dalvin Cook. Now that Dalvin Cook is healthy. He is really dominating the touches, dominating the game. He's productive and efficient every time he touches the football. And what that's going to do, it's going to limit what you can do with Kirk Cousins. And, you know, 15 for 21, 174 yards and a touchdown. Um, and they're winning games like that. That You can't put that on Kirk Cousins. Uh, all right. Then we've got Marcus Mariota. How can he not be last, by the way, Sam? <laughs> for me, he's kind of – you talk about Mitchell Zerbisky being a guy you have no hope for. For Mark, for me, Mark Mario is certainly in that in that range right now. I don't trust him at all. He's just a mediocre quarterback for me. The Titans are a team that like that division is pretty open right now. Even with Jacoby Brissett playing well, there's still hope for other teams to win. But 
Mariota just – I think Tennessee is going to be chained to that mediocre 7-9 and nine kind of area as long as they have a guy like Marcus Mariota at quarterback. Well, they always have been. When do they make the change to Ryan Tannehill, Anthony? I think they give it a week or two once Taylor Lewan returns and they see – uh, how Mariota does with better protection, but it's going to happen soon. All right. Um, let's go on. Let's look at Case Keenum. I mean, you got him at 28. You got Jimmy Garoppolo at 27. Is there any concern yet with Jimmy Garoppolo and the way he has been kind of spotty at best, Sam? That? Oh. I, 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 I think it's been. Sam gets to go next. I think there's been concerns about that since last year. At the start of last season, he wasn't looking too good. Obviously, he got injured afterwards. But I think there has got to be concerns at this point. He's playing a Steelers defense that only added Minka Fitzpatrick a couple of days ago. And that's not a good Steelers defense right now, outside of maybe the pass rush, which has been good in the last two years. The secondary is terrible. Linebacker coverage isn't great. And you end up throwing two interceptions and you lose the fumbles. I just don't know. You still win the game, obviously, because it's Pittsburgh right now. And there's Mason Rudolph on the other side of the ball, but it's I, I am worried. Like you can't do that against Pittsburgh. You do that against any other team, you lose the game. No, oh, no, not against Miami or Cincinnati or Arizona. You can That's still true. win the game then. Um, <laughs> so my question to you, Anthony, is this: Is there ever a point where maybe you start thinking about Mullins again? No, because I think you know that you are going to get turnovers with Jimmy Garoppolo. He's a gunslinger quarterback, and he's going to make his mistakes. He's going to take chances. But I also think that he's good enough to rebound and put the team in a position to win. So I think this is exactly what we expect from Jimmy Garoppolo. But gunslinger quarterbacks hardly ever win world championships. Oh, he has the Niners sitting at 3-0 and right now, going into a bye. They're going to get Tevin Coleman back. So I, I think the 49ers are in pretty good shape. They also beat the Buccaneers, the Bengals, and the Steelers. And only the Bengals game did he play well in. Um, let's go to Case Keenum, Anthony. 30 for 43, 332 yards, two touchdowns, three interceptions, two fumbles lost. I think we already talked about this a little bit, but you got to at some point go to Dwayne Haskins, don't you? You know, I, I've said it before, as long as Jay Gruden feels like he could be coaching for his job at the end of the season, uh, he's going to keep the veteran in there. Sam? Yeah, I think the Redskins are such a dysfunctional organization. There's no point in trying to predict what they're going to do. But you absolutely need to look at Dwayne Haskins, especially if this continues by week eight or so, I would think, right around that range. Or whenever the bye week comes where you ever have extra time to sit down with the rookie and go over stuff, I would consider around that point in time looking to make a move. Kingdom hasn't done before this game. Kingdom wasn't doing too bad. And he just basically got blown up by the, the Bears' defense because Washington's offense and their offensive line all have all kinds of issues. Their receiving core is not great. Their best receiver is a rookie third-round pick. So I can't put it all on Keenum, but obviously five turnovers are going to fall down the list quite a bit. Uh, and I think Haskins has to come here at some point this year. You can't go the rest of the year. You can't justify that to anyone, I don't think. All right, Anthony. Except for Joe, Dan Snyder. Joe Flacco at 29. You want to talk a little bit about Joe? Because I think Joe's basically just a punching bag for the rest of the year. Yeah, Flacco, uh, he's not in a good spot. There's nothing behind him. You know, Drew Locke, I think he's on injured reserve. Um, the Broncos are just a bad team. Flacco, I thought he could at least keep them competitive, and that's not even happening right now. All right. Sam. There's not much else to say. It's just, uh, you know, the Broncos are terrible. Sam Mason Rudolph, is he the answer in Pittsburgh? No, I'm hoping not. I'm praying that Ben Rossworth comes back next year and that's healthy because what I saw from Mason Rudolph was terrible. Because you consider, like, he had 174 yards, but 76 of those yards came on that one catch and run by Juju Smith-Schuster. And that was like a 13-yard throw, 14-yard throw, 15 yards maybe that's usually caught, and then he did the rest by himself running. So if you take that throw out of the equation, Mason Rudolph doesn't even have a doesn't even have a hundred yards passing. So I don't understand how you can do that. And also, the defense forces five turnovers, and you somehow find a way to lose the game. I don't understand how that's even acceptable. You can't do that. And for me, I hope Mason Rudolph isn't the future because he doesn't look like a quarterback who can uphold the future right now. He yeah, just doesn't. I'm... 
He doesn't I'm, look ready. I hope he's the quarterback of the future. I think oh, I know great. you do. I think it would be great for you to get us a role with Mason Rudolph. Don't you, Anthony, uh, don't you think it would be great to watch the Pittsburgh Steelers play with Mason Rudolph for the next decade? Yeah, as long as he plays well. <laughs> oh, you're an asshole. Um, all right, let's <laughs> see. What about Brian Fitzpatrick and Jarrett Steedham? No, nah, I'm kidding. Um, Josh Rosen. I think Josh Rosen's Josh Rosen, and he's got really no chance with playing with the team he's playing with, but I don't think he's got any chance no matter who he plays with. And then Luke Falk. I mean, he's a practice squad quarterback, as you put in the article. So the sad thing here is there's 32 teams in the NFL. You've only got 32 quarterbacks ranked. And when I look at this, I think there's like at least seven or eight guys here that probably shouldn't even be starting NFL quarterbacks. Am I right, Sam? No, you're right. There's a real drop-off, in my opinion, right around that. Well, I can see like there's probably 24 quarterbacks, I think, which are actually starting quarterbacks, maybe 26. But everyone else is, I don't, I wouldn't consider a starting quarterback. I wouldn't even consider them like guys who might start next year. They might end up being transition quarterbacks long term, but I don't. I wouldn't count these guys coming back. Obviously, there's a lot of injured guys right now still, but still, I don't think that even going into the season, there were four or five guys who were starters who shouldn't be starters. It's just that simple. There's a little bit of a quarterback issue for some teams in the league right now. All right. Um, Anthony, do you want to say anything in defense of Dak Prescott at number one again? Not number one, but I think he should be at least in the top five. I think he should, too. I don't know what the hell's wrong with Sam, but we're going to keep talking to him each week until he gets Dak ranked in the top five for you. How about that? That's fair. Okay. So, Sam, sooner or later you're going to have to do it, or Anthony's probably just going to drive to your house or dorm room and, you know, handle what he's got to do. Because you know how Cowboy fans <laughs> are. They're nuts, and they haven't won anything yeah. in forever. So. Well, according to them, they're going to win the Super Bowl every year, though. They've already won it. I mean, the Browns oh. won it before in preseason, so Browns fans are worse. And I don't want to hear it because you're a Steelers fan, and Steelers fans just talk about shit that happened in the 70s. Oh. And see, I'm but a Bengals fan. We had fan. the greatest team of all anything. time. You didn't have the greatest team of all time, but you had one of the three greatest teams Yeah, that teams would be the Cowboys time. in what, when they blew the Bills out? No, it wouldn't. It would be no, the San no, Francisco no. 49ers of 1985 or 84. I'm sorry. That was the greatest team that ever lived, and that's not even questionable. And y'all don't want to have that debate with me because the 49ers team was complete. I mean, you're, you're looking at a team that had Roger Craig and Wendell Tyler as their running backs. You had Jerry Rice and, you know, all these dudes. They even had Dwight Clark with that team. And then you had a defense that was pretty damn good. If you remember, they shut the Bears out in the playoffs. They gave up 10 to the Giants. And then they held Dan Marino to, what was the final score of Super Bowl 19? 38 to 16. So they played three playoff games and gave up a 26 points. I think the second best team I ever saw was the 89 49ers, by the way. But third would be the Pittsburgh Steelers, and fourth would be the 92 Cowboys. I'll take that. That's a win. I'll take it. But I'm not really sure about the three and the four. I've just known Anthony longer than you, so I just kind of went with his team over yours. <laughs> But I, I think both teams were damn good. But my question is, if that game goes to the final minute, what happens if Troy Aikman's got the ball and he's got to go score? I know what happens if Terry Bradshaw's got the ball and got to go score. But didn't the Cowboys have to go and score against Pittsburgh? No. And that, that Super was, Bowl that 30? Was, that was the two interceptions yeah, Pittsburgh from had a, Pittsburgh, But Pittsburgh had a lead in the, no, at halftime, no? No. That was the game where it was like 20 to 10, and they got the onside kick back. And, yeah, yeah that's Neil game. O'Donnell played catch with Larry Brown. Yeah. So, I mean, no, <laughs> he didn't drive him down there. It was Neil O'Donnell played catch with Larry Brown, and that's what won y'all the Super Bowl. Troy Aikman wasn't that great in that game. Hell, Emmett Smith got shut out in that game. The great Emmett Smith got manhandled. I think he was like he good 18 linebackers. carries for like 54 yards, but you had LeVon Kirkland kicked his ass in that game. Yeah. And we had Greg Lloyd and Kevin Green on that team too. Yeah, the only problem was they had Neil O'Donnell also. Yeah. 
Well, Neil O'Donnell wasn't bad, and I still think at least one of those interceptions wasn't his fault. It was a bad route. I'm not sure on the other one. But that was a, no, the other one. That was a really good football game, though. But, yeah, it ended up 27-17. At halftime, I think the Cowboys were up like 13-7. to And then, if I remember right, it goes to 20-7. to And then Pittsburgh either kicked a field goal or scored a touchdown. And then they got an onside kick back. And then they couldn't do anything with it because Neil O'Donnell threw a pick. I'm trying, what the hell? I, I think Aikman only threw for like 200 yards in that game, Anthony. And I think Emmett ran for like 50 or 60. I don't remember exactly. I just remember Leon LeVon Kirkland loves to talk about how many yards that Emmett Smith didn't gain against them in the Super Bowl. But they still won. So. Yeah, but the point is, we still don't know what happens with Troy Aikman in the final minute of a Super Bowl. We know what happens when Terry Bradshaw has got to win the game at the end, and we know what happens when Joe Montana has to win the game at the end. I'll tell you another team that I would throw in there that might be able to beat all of them would be the 98 Broncos. Because that was a great defense, a great offensive line. You had a Hall of Fame quarterback, and you had one of the greatest running backs I've ever seen, Terrell Davis. And, of course, you'd also, yeah, that was- you got to throw in the 1988 Cincinnati Bengals, too. Oh, of course. Yeah, well, just because I'm here. I mean, we don't want to be rude. <laughs> and damn it, if they could have just stopped Joe Montana on that last drive, I could have said that with a straight face. But they didn't. <laughs> That's why I bring up the 49ers. All right, guys. Anything else before we go, Anthony? No, I think we got about everything covered. All right, Sam? No, I think we got everything. We're all good. All right. Since we're all good, we're going to wrap it up. I want to remind everybody to go to bednow.eu. Use the promo code TRUTH100 for a 100% cash back bonus up to your first deposit of $500. You can also click on the gruelingtruth.com banner at the top of the gruelingtruth.com page. And it'll take you to bednow.eu where you can use the promo code TRUTH100. All right, guys, we're going to wrap it up tonight at 7 o'clock. I will be back with former Cincinnati Bengal linebacker Joe Kelly for the Cincinnati Bengals Weekly Show at 8 o'clock with Cole Hanna for the Indiana Football Weekly Show. Yeah, we really do that. It's stupid, isn't it? And at 9 o'clock, CFL Weekly Pick'em Show with Brian Schmidt and CFL legend, four-time Grey Cup champion Robert Drummond, and then the College Football Weekly Show after that. So it'll be a busy day on the grueling truth. If you've got nothing else to do, you can tune in at 7 o'clock and go from there. And also, is there an FF face-off today, Anthony? No, uh, tomorrow, though. There was one last night, and then tomorrow we're going to begin previewing um, week four. All right, and tomorrow me and Anthony will be back at noon to preview the Thursday night game between the Green Bay Packers and the Philadelphia Eagles. You can hear all of our shows on iHeartRadio, iTunes, TuneIn, Spreaker, Stitcher, Spotify, YouTube, CastBox, wherever you find podcasts, you'll find the grueling truth. So for Sam Teets, Anthony Servino, I'm Mike Goodpaster. You've been listening to the grueling truth, where the legends speak. <laughs>